Hi everyone and a very warm welcome to this, the third in our critical conversations um, in the run up to the start of semester here in St Andrews. Um, a very warm welcome to you all um, who have managed to, to get to St Andrews as well. I hope you're having a good orientation week so far. Thanks also to everyone who managed to join us for one or both of the previous events. Um, this is the third of a series. So the first one we were looking at uh, collections, the history of collecting um, and the museums. Uh, last week we focused in on empire, stories of empire within the collection. Um, and this week we are looking forward um, through thinking about legacies. So we're, we're looking at a different object from the collection um, and as always we'll have the same format. So we're joined by three exciting panellists who are here happy to share their expertise and their perspective on the things that we'll be talking about tonight. So what I'll do is I'll briefly introduce the panel to you um, and each panel member will give a brief presentation on their own interests and why they wanted to be part of this conversation tonight. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the object or the images that we're going to be using as a kind of springboard for our discussion tonight. Um, and I think each of our panellists will probably make reference um, to that as well at some point. Uh, so my name is Emma Bond. I am an academic in the School of Modern Languages and I'm really thrilled tonight to be joined by Erin Limack, um, who is here as, as a student representative, but is also involved in a very exciting project, thinking about the history of Dundee um, and less well-known aspects of, um, I don't know whether we are calling it the sort of hidden history of Dundee or the sort of dark history of Dundee, but we'll hear more about that later on. We're also joined by Manhattan Murphy Brown, another student representative who's here also representing a really interesting project um, which is being done in collaboration with the School of History um, called Spence, thinking about um, abolition and slavery stories um, which are linked to St Andrews and the history of St Andrews. So again, we're excited to hear about the work that you're doing on that. And last but definitely not least, we're very thrilled to have Dr. Kate Coucher with us from the School of Art History. Um, Kate is an expert in African arts um, with a particular focus on Ethiopian arts. Um, and we're really excited to have her expertise on the panel tonight. So as always, um, you, if you need visual captions, which I meant to say at the start, you can find them in the tool bar at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you click on the three dots, um, you'll find a way to put the visual captions on. And the images that we're going to be talking about should be in your uh, Q&A field as well. So if you go to there, um, you should be able to see what we're talking about. So this week, um, I'm really excited because we're talking about some artworks by one of my favourite artists. Um, these are nine large photographic artworks by the Scottish artist Maud Salter, uh, who was born in 1960 and um, passed in 2008. Um, these are held in the collection and were acquired through the Boswell um, collection. Uh, they were made in 1993. Um, and they explore um, Salter's Scottish family roots, her ancestry, and really the connections between family and identity. Um, so we can see, for example, pictures of, of Salter with her grandfather, who was also um, quite a keen and talented amateur photographer. Um, so thinking about what, what pictures are taken, who gets to take pictures, and what they take pictures of. Um, I won't say anything more about them now, but I hope you can see them um, and they will be, as I say, a springboard for our discussion. So perhaps um, we'll give uh, the words to our panellists now and perhaps we can start with Erin. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, as Emma said before, I am a fourth year student in the School of Classics. I'm also spearheading uh, the student-led exhibition project on the more hidden histories of Dundee, covering topics including Dundee and the slave trade and also Dundee and Calcutta. Um, I was really excited to join this Legacies and sort of look into the future um, panel as we are very keen in the Hidden Histories group to also not just look at our past but also to look towards the future 
what's going on um, in today's world or our recent history that 50, 100, 200 years down the line will not be seen as acceptable, but we don't even think about it today. So again, thank you for having me. And perhaps if, if Manhattan, you want to introduce yourself next. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Manhattan Murphy Brown. I'm a fourth year undergrad uh, studying IR and history at St Andrews. Uh, today I'm here representing the Spence Project, which is a group of uh, it's students leading a project looking into the connection between the transatlantic slave trade um, and its connection, both modern and historical, um, into the Fife and St Andrews area. Um, I find this extremely interesting and pertinent to uh, what we're looking at currently, just in terms of looking into how our own landscape has been shaped by the legacies of not only colonialism and slavery, um, but just how the individual stories of people have been impacted by those and hearing um, potentially tales which may not be um, as widely distributed as, as others have been in the field of history. Thank you, and Kate? Thank you so much, Emma. Um, and uh, it's it's a terrific opportunity to to kind of speak here with Manhattan and Erin. I wasn't aware of these student projects, and uh, there's definitely a strong overlap with things that I'm very interested in. So I'm a lecturer in history of art. Um, I've just been here for a couple of years. Um, my uh, research, my first book project, is all about Ethiopia and the revolution there in the 70s and the global Cold War. But I have much broader interests um, in the kind of the study of the arts of Africa and also collections of African art here in Scotland. When I interviewed for my job here at St Andrews in my presentation, I said one of the things I really wanted to do was to get into the storerooms of the McManus Gallery and really have uh, a, a good look at what they have because they don't have an African curator. And a lot of that work has not been uh, researched and looked at. And so to that end, um, I teach a class, I teach a couple of classes obviously in art history, I teach a class on the modern arts of Africa, um, which I'll be doing this semester, but next semester I'm going to be teaching a brand new class on Scotland and the arts of Africa and we're going to look at um, historical connections between Scotland, Scotland's involvement with colonialism, um, and also the era, the eras that follow that, and this is where we'll come into modern and contemporary, we'll definitely look at Maud Salter. Maud Salter's work also connects to another project I've been working on with a couple of uh, recent St Andrews graduates on uh, the Argyle collection, which is a collection of modern and contemporary art on the west coast of Scotland. It was created in the 60s as a public art collection for schools. And in amongst what is mostly a collection of Scottish art, there are about 12 paintings that come from East Africa. And these are modernist uh, works from Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, Zambia and South Africa. Um, and they were brought, they were bought in the era of independence in the 60s as uh, an educational resource for the children of Scotland. And interestingly, I was reading Maud Salter's obituary just before uh, our meeting today. And obviously she, uh, uh, um, in one of her very important poems, talks about this uh, interesting relationship between Scotland and the African continent that they may have more in common with one another uh, than we might assume, in particular in her case, of course, Ghana. And the founder of the Argyle collection felt very strongly the same, that the highlands of Scotland uh, had a lot in common with um, uh, historical communities in Africa. So, um, so yeah, I have a number of things that I'm interested in, I think, that are relevant to the Maud uh, collection, and I hope Know that we'll be able to look at them more in class too. Yeah, thanks very much for that. Um, I will we'll get back to Maud Selter, I think, in a minute. Um, just to make you aware as well that if you have questions for the panelists or in general, you can um, just type them into the Q and A, and we will get to them as soon as as soon as they come up or as soon as we can. Um, so do keep them coming in because we really want to make this a live discussion. And the first thing I just wanted to pick up on was um, something that uh, you also mentioned, Kate, was, was the sense that Erin and, and Manhattan, these are both student led projects. And I think when we're thinking about kind of legacies and futures, it's it's really important that that's coming from 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 you guys rather than perhaps from people like me and Kate. Right. Um, and I've 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 been in 
contact quite a lot with the Uncover Ed uh, group at Edinburgh, who are also kind of trying to do sort of decolonial work within the university and thinking about the sort of emissions that are um, not, you know, not present in, in the, the story that the university tells about its own history and its own alumni. Um, so I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about what it's like to set up this kind of project and why you both thought it was so important to do so. Um, perhaps Erin uh, first and then and then Manhattan. Um, for me, um, the idea of this project came during lockdown over the summer. I live in Dundee. I was born here, um, so it really is sort of feels like my city. And I've been to all of the museums several times, but there's so much of Dundee's history that is not spoken about. Until recently, with the sort of the Black Black Lives Movement and things like that, I had no idea Dundee had a connection with the slave trade, and now that is quite sort of ignorant of myself. And I thought. How many other people in the city don't know about it, as well as other aspects of the city's history? So I just put a call out to some other students. Um, I contacted Ananya, um, who's um, uh, who was really enthusiastic um, about my about the project, and slowly we've just been building a team together and starting to put down the bare bones of this project. And now we're starting to come into the semester. Um, we'll be able to contact some experts and members of staff and to really get our research going. Um, I think there's there's quite a lot of overlap, I think, with myself. Um, I'm representing the, the Spence Project. We're a group of uh, six students um, within St Andrews, but we are currently working with the university um, to bring this project to life. My involvement of it really came uh, much earlier in the year, I think I was I was contacted by uh, many people within the team, just have really informal conversations about the the, the legacy of the slave trade. Um, as a history student, and specifically having a focus on post-colonial history, um, conversations about this I find were very interesting. Um, and I spoke to uh, Luke, a member of the team, um, who's American and has been educated within American uh, universities. And the conversations between the US and the UK are obviously very different, but there's also um, been, I, in, in my opinion, a much more uh, almost clear cut conversation about the university and uh, historical involvement within the slave trade, especially over the past year. Um, and this was all really heightened over the over this past summer with the Black Lives Matter movement and the George Floyd protests. Um, in which many people, not only in the US where the, the case happened, but also in the UK and internationally, were questioning about racial issues, cross-racial issues, and specifically links with that. Um, and the conversations that kept on coming up with us was specifically regarding what was happening in Bristol at the time, in which statues were being torn down because of connections with slavery and another massive racial injustices. Was this true? If this was correct, was it the right way to do it? Um, and then the concept of a more formalized project came about. Um, we were operating under the name uh, St. Andrew's, I think it was St. Andrew's Slavery and Abolitionism Project for quite a while, which is a massive mouthful. <laughs> um, but um, we we did some some research and we we came across the work of uh, Dr. Julia Prest, um, who wrote quite in depth about David Spence, um, who has a very uh, large connection within within Fife and our own local community. Um, very much in brief, um, David Spence was brought from the West Indies um, to Fife um, as a slave, and when he was baptised, he refused to return, um, and it was a very long legal battle, a very interesting legal battle through that, but it was through the uh, cross-racial, cross-class based uh, work of miners within the town, within people, uh, sorry, for miners within the area, within uh, people within the area, in order to um, keep that and, and really almost a, a cross-racial uh, removal of bondage and shackles through that. Um, and that story not only was extremely pertinent to us, but was also extremely new to myself and many other people on the team. And we thought that if these stories exist within St Andrews and within Fife itself, um, and, and we who were interested in this weren't aware of this, how many other people who were potentially studying physics or 
and I was studying the University at all, but just lived within the area, didn't know about this. Um, and that was really our impetus behind the project into looking between the links between the transatlantic slave trade um, and the local area. And uh, we're really looking forward to what's going to happen in the next year. Great, thank you so much, both of you, for those really, really fascinating introductions. And I think what we've tried to do so far with the conversations is, is kind of trace through objects in the collections where remnants of these sorts of stories that tell of, of imperialism and, and colonialism um, might lie. And I think, um, Kate, what, what's interesting is when, when we have other things in the collection, like the Maud Salter photographs, what impact do those photographs have? Or what can it, what could they do to kind of highlight those stories within within the collection, do you think? Yeah, I mean, the Maud Salter photographs um, are uh, really, I mean, they're a terrific uh, teaching resource, of course. Um, they're obviously visually very striking. They are very large, imposing photographs. Um, they are these kind of deeply personal images from Salter's kind of personal sort of family album that have been, um, you know, uh, amplified to a scale that they occupy the space of the gallery in a way that is, um, you know, quite sort of physically present. Now they, obviously you have the work of a, of a, of a woman of mixed heritage, of Ghanaian and Scottish heritage. So uh, somebody who obviously uh, speaks to multiple identities and her work allows us to kind of see her uh, exploring what it means to inhabit those multiple identities, to have, uh, I mean, some of the titles of the works and the significant other series, I think are incredibly affectionate. You know, this, there's this kind of reference to Gargar and a veil, one of them's called a veils and kisses, as if there's, you know, that you look at this sort of Victorian, fusty old Victorian lady, and actually perhaps behind it, there's a great grandmother or a great doting aunt, or you know, there's all these all sort of fascinating stories that um, I think, unpack a, a whole world of complexity around Scottish identity that um, that 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 are stories that that we ha are not maybe necessarily aware of because we're Scotland is is a place that often is um, uh, sort of reduced or stereotyped to a certain type of identity and uh, and Maud Salter's work absolutely affronts that so um, so yeah, I mean, I think that they they offer this, uh, they offer kind of alternative and unexpected histories, but also um, kind of ways into conversations about Scotland's historical connections with places on the African continent, in her case, Ghana. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think I I came to sort of Maud Salter's work through Circus, which is um, a different uh, series but I think even these photographs are enacting some of the kind of interventions that, that Salter is so famous for right so they have you know pinholes they have tears they're folded they have writing around the frames they are um, they are kind of acted on as images and, and there is a sense of, of, of the active within them right and um, that's that's not a, that's not a finished story in any sense it's, it's a reworking of of stories. And I wondered um, for Erin and Manhattan whether that, that speaks to the kind of work that you're trying to do in a sense and trying to kind of come back into these stories and perhaps get something sort of new out of them that can give us a sense of, of, of futurity, if you like. Um, well, if, if I may, um, for, for me personally, I found them extremely engaging because, um, as you're saying, Kate, how personal they they come across um despite being you know in within connections and presented and almost made in a public sense um the the personal stories and specifically how uh, family oriented and personal they are uh, really stood out to me in in terms of uh, what's almost the overall aim of, of the projects that we're looking into um we've the, there is one thing in terms of um an issue we, which we've had is that we have almost swathes of information um, that we're, we're finding over this amount of time, but if it's presented in such a way which is almost very analytical, very data driven, um, it doesn't necessarily get the point across in, in the best possible way. I know when I have conversations with, with many people, um, the, the dates of when slavery was eventually brought to a complete end are, are being thrown at me in terms of, well, if it just came to an end, then clearly there's no legacy of it and this kind of thing. Um, 
But relating to the individual stories, especially uh, with ourselves, David Spence being so personal, but uh, within the within the sorts of photographs, looking into Scottish identity, um, especially immigrant identity, connections between what it means to be Scottish and and uh, Ghanaian, and these personal touches um, to the photos, I think really gives across details and stories uh, much more vividly and especially emotively. Um, much more than than data and facts have driven of this many people came into Scotland. These are the population breakdowns in which you know X amount of people live within Scotland um, from this background and heritage. Um, and I think going through them specifically in how we look to present uh, the links between transatlantic slavery into the future and and how it has affected people now, um, relating to those more personal emotive stories and and frankly quite fascinating stories. Um, I think speaks a lot more to me than um, any kind of, of, of data or or, um, or that kind of thing would, I think. Um, I definitely agree with what um, a lot of what Man Manhattan said. Um, for the Dundee project, um, our, our group's really been speaking about how to present uh, the information we've got and we've really decided that we actually want to go down the stories route, the people's personal stories, um, to make it more personal um, and these sort of photographs are such an amazing sort of example of that. They tell the story of sort of her life, her own sort of snapshots and um, we're also looking at more creative ways so we're not maybe just seeing a visual um, and uh, with the uh, mod slaughter and things like that being um, a poet and a playwright and things like that as well, you could add things into these sort of um, sort of photographic collections, and then suddenly you've also got a voice as well as being able to see. Um, I think it's so important to be able to display these sort of things in many different formats. Yes, have the facts. Yes, have the figures. But what about the people that these things happened to, the people that were showing, the, what were their stories? I think that's how people can really sort of connect and understand or begin to understand who these people, who people were, what they went through, as opposed to just being sort of dictated the direct histories. Absolutely. And I mean, Kate, you mentioned that these would be a, a fantastic teaching resource. And I wondered if you could just share with us a bit more about how you use kind of uh, more contemporary, I suppose, visual visual works to kind of shed light back on 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 past histories in your in your teaching. Yeah, well, obviously, I use uh, I use images in a lot of different ways. Um, in this case, I mean, I think that more Salter's uh, specific identity and her voice is so important. A lot of the time when I'm when, when we're looking at the historic arts of Africa, especially arts that are in collections here in Europe or other colonial uh, in, in other in, in the UK or other colonial settings, you know, you have uh, works that are effectively anonymous often that the obviously the name of the maker, the origin is, is kind of ripped away from the object. Um, and so, uh, you know, you're going, you're often through a process of kind of looking at, you, you enter and you look at an object, say something from the McManus collection, and you have nothing more than, you know, the, the possibly the name of the type of object, vaguely a region, but sometimes not even that. And some of the things on display in the McManus have almost nothing next to them because the person who collected took, you know, the object didn't care to sort of um, didn't care to obviously record such data. Now with Maud Salter, we have a contemporary artist who is very consciously engaging her uh, her mixed heritage, her Ghanaian identity, as well as her Scottish identity, her um, her life growing up in and around Glasgow, and. Uh, these works, we treat them obviously not just as a kind of narrative of that, but as objects in and of themselves. And I think, Emma, you're absolutely right to kind of point out that one of the real beauties of these works is their materiality, is their is their rips and their punctures and their their uses and their those uh, sort of white chalk writings around the outside are really important as well. It's actually if you look at them on the screen, in fact, you can't always see the writing. So um, that's why, you know, when these go on display, everybody must go and see them in person because you really can't appreciate them until you see them. These kind of chalk annotations around the side are so important because um, 
they're kind of some of them are a little cryptic we don't necessarily they're kind of fragments potentially that reference the image in one of them it's much more explicit you know it's 68 it's the mexico olympics it's black power you know it's tommy smith and um, and john carlos these are all images that are evoked by what appears to be a kind of sweet image of her and an elderly an elder relative um so uh, yes, when I use these things in class or work like this, or these works in class, I want students to not just look at, only look at the content, but really examine the kind of material, the material, that, the way it's been um, obviously presented and uh, treated by the, handled by the artist before we, before we come to it. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. That was that was brilliant. Um, I think I mean let, let's stay on that though because and and, and and for everyone listening, do do send in your photo uh, your photos, send in photos if you like, send in questions um, because we'd love to we'd love to hear from you and we'd love to answer your questions. Um, I think it's it's just amazing that we have these images in the university collection. I think they go very far away from the kind of objects that we've been talking about in in previous weeks, um, and I think it's so exciting. I mean. Erin Manhattan, wh where would you like to see these displayed? What would you like, how would you like to see these kind of really speak to the sorts of, of future projects that you guys have um, uh, as students? Erin. Sorry, can you hear me? Oh, sorry, <laughs> microphone issue there. Um, I think for me, these sort of things should be dis they should be accessible. That's something I come to a lot. Um, there's a lot of spaces that I have been to that seem accessible, but um, if you're in a chair, you have eyesight issues or things like that, they're very difficult to actually access. Um, so definitely a space, I mean, I think um, a space maybe like somewhere at the Gateway Building where there is lift access, it's a bigger space um, to be able to have them um, displayed and be um, open for everyone to see and definitely to have some sort of, um, how to say it, uh, not quite audience participation, but a way the, the visitor can connect with them with the pictures to maybe even put their own opinion or maybe think about their own family photos and what do they really mean? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. It's, you know, it's it's a way of communicating, isn't it, about what, you know, what, what the university has and what we can what we can do with those collections and, and a way of of perhaps, you know, getting new stories as well. Manhattan, is there something you, you would like to add there? Um. Well, I, I mean, it's it's difficult in a sense because I think the the imposing nature, I mean, it's been mentioned earlier of, of the photos, um, I think really adds to it. And I think the specifically the white chalk outlines and, and these things that have been mentioned, which don't necessarily come across in a digital sense, um, would, it would it would almost be an extreme shame to miss them in, in that case. However, on the other hand, I believe that Something that um, I found particularly pertinent is they are not only extremely striking, they're extremely shareable. I mean, even into the, um, the I think even the banner of, of this event was one of the photos itself. And someone let me know early, it's like, wow, what a, what a striking photo at the top of it, really, it drew people in. Um, my own background is um, my, my mother's Irish um, and my, my dad's Jamaican. Um, and specifically growing up through the 1950s and 1960s. Um, so I sent this back and <laughs> sent the, some of them over to say like, this is, these are the kind of photos and, and instantly stories coming back of, you know, oh, well, this is my experience with it. And this is, you know, I was talking to uncle and auntie and this kind of thing um, was, was, was amazing. And I think almost missing out on that if you, if you are not um, in the local area and, and are not able to participate in a sense would also be such a shame. I think the, um, how they are presented in, in necessarily the, the form of photographs is also something that can be widely distributed and shared, but are done through the university collections and are almost uniquely Scottish in a sense, specifically through more of Um So I think there's there's almost a, a weighing up of the benefits of the gas. I really don't have an answer for it, but um, I, I think they're incredibly engaging. And I think if, if it was up to me, I think everyone would, uh, would have a chance to, to come in and, and give their own thoughts on them. 
Absolutely, yeah, thank you. Um, I wondered, because I mean, it, you're absolutely right, and somebody mentioned obviously Maud, Maud Salter, very famous also as, as a poet, and I think when they were first exhibited, um, they were exhibited together with, um, with two poems as well. Um, and I wondered, you know, with, with your two projects um, in particular, what kind of what kind of outputs? I mean, you, you've spoken obviously about the focus that you have both on kind of data and stories, but but who are you who are you talking to with this work, and and what kind of things do you want to achieve with them? Is it you know what kind of materials do you want to come out of them, Erin? Um, for our project, we're initially speaking to the people of Dundee, but to anyone really. Um, anyone in Scotland, anyone in the world. And we're wanting to do that through so many different medias, not just through sort of um, artifacts and things like that, but we're even looking into songs um, about Dundee. Um, we're doing um, a small section on the women in the jute mills, for example, and we're looking into the different weaving songs that used to be sung um, to really bring it sort of home. And there's some people in Dundee who still remember that. Um, who still remember the mills sort of being up and running, they remember the songs. So partially it will be to help people to learn, to reminisce, to understand these people as people. And we want to do it in so many different formats and not just have a very basic sort of here's object, small bit of information. We want to bring it to life just as alive as these people were back, back when they were alive. Manhattan. Um, I think when when we were first conceptualizing the project, one of the things that stood out to us was the idea of it being um, not necessarily limited to the scope of audience, which would come with a with a, uh, a history project that we would be expecting to do in, in any other regards. It was very different in that sense. Um, we, currently, the team is fourth year students and will be graduating, fingers crossed, <laughs> within, within the next year. And part of that is having almost a, a legacy of the project to be able to hand that off into. And I think if there is little engagement in that fact, uh, not only by people who study just history, um, that would be an absolute shame. So something that we, we came across quite early was the idea of having it be extremely public and in a space in which um, people who were just walking past, who had no background in history, who were you know, just getting a lunch or studying for physics or, or one of these things um, would have access to. And I think specifically in a visual medium, um, we're, we're looking into that quite intently, whether that comes across in things that are created in order to demonstrate the points which um, were potentially not photographed or, or, or drawn. An issue we're having currently right now is the fact that um, we are the Spence project, but very, very few actual depictions of David Spence are made available um, or whether we use um, sort of less traditional, more visual elements in order to do that. Um, and putting it in a, a public space and looking at these um, less traditional ways of, of coming across that data in order to make it engaging first and people just walking past be able to have that be eye catching um, is something that we're, we're juggling quite, uh, quite thoroughly quite right now. Great, thank you. Um, and Kate, you've mentioned um, some of the projects that you've done with students in the past and the Argyle uh, works. Can you tell us some of your kind of future projects and, and your kind of ambitions as well for the university collections, which is such a kind of dynamic and fast growing, I think, sort of um, team and spirit behind it at the moment? What would you like to see yeah. happen? Yeah. Maybe. Well, I mean, my first thought is that um, I would love for the Argyle collection to be exhibited alongside the Maud Salter works because I actually think they have a lot of interesting things to say to each other. The paintings in the Argyle collection, the paintings and works on paper and, um, and other things that are there. Um, and I can, I'll send a link, maybe I'll tweet a link. You can, anyway, you can find a link to the work that we did on it. But they are all works of art that um, are made by kind of the first generation of, uh, sort of modern artists in independent nations in East Africa. And they were collected by the poet Naomi Mitchison when she was visiting these cities in the 60s. Um, and she bought them on an absolute shoestring for the school children of Argyle. And they're currently sitting in a storeroom at Loch Gilpet High School on the Argyle Peninsula. So they really are, these are works that have been largely forgotten in many ways. Even within the Argyle collection, they're considered 
sort of interesting anomalies because the collection is mostly Scottish. And so the African, uh, the works that come from East Africa have been largely forgotten. But Naomi Mitchison really thought that they were seminal because they offered this opportunity for children who lived in a very remote part of Scotland to have through art a, a connection, a kind of experiential connection with another part of the world, then going through a process of decolonization. And she had this uh, thought that uh, the Highlands of Scotland had things in common with newly independent nations, particularly this um, uh, sort of the clan, the historic clan structure of the Highlands uh, versus kind of um, uh, the ethnic groups of Africa that are coming to form new nation states, basically. So um, I would say she was a little thin on discussions of Scotland's engagement with colonialism, but um, I sort of forgive her that because she did bring these works to school children in Argyll in a way that I think is incredibly progressive for the 1960s. Um, and she wanted children growing up in a fishing village in Argyll to look at a painting made by an artist living by Lake Tanganyika, for example, and, and, uh, and, and to enjoy these works in that context. So I think this kind of, I do think the Argyll works which are of um, you know 30 40 years earlier than Maud Salter's works will have an interesting conversation with her works around um, connections between uh, Scotland and the African continent um, so I think it would be great to see them together um, in my other work in my teaching anyway certainly my um, Scotland and the Arts of Africa class that I'll be teaching next semester my hope for that class was that I wanted to give, so partly this is because um, there are, as I'm sure you are all aware, there's this, there are huge repositories, obviously, of objects, many of which is what is on display in the McManus or the National Museums of Scotland is really a fragment of, of what they actually have in their storerooms. And these are very loaded and, uh, and sometimes very difficult collections right now. These are, these are and obviously very, very important conversations about restitution and, um, and uh, redressing um, uh, colonial wrongs. So, you know, what what can we do as academics? What can we do at the university to participate in those conversations? Well, we can we can read, obviously, and we should read. We should definitely read the many many books about this. But I also would like students in my class to uh, have the opportunity to work on a single object that is in those collections, to do as much provenance research as they can do on that object and try to reconstruct something of a story around it. And within the safety of our classroom, since they aren't museum professionals, they can make the recommendation that this should be returned or who it should be returned to. These are the kinds of active discussions that I want students in my class to be having. But I want them to also recognise that those conversations are complicated, they're not straightforward, um, they require engaged research and deep respect um, and they involve you know really um, trying to, I want students to engage with it with a single object rather than you know try to write about 10 or 20 or 30 or a thousand. So my hope out of the class that I teach in the spring for the first time we're going to found hopefully, I've been talking to the National Museums of Scotland about this, this is something we might do together, a database of uh, student research on objects of African art in Scottish collections. Um, so the bits of writing that you would produce in my class, we would find a way to obviously then make sure that is stored and available um, so that we have student research in, into provenance and the history of these objects and that that research can contribute to these very important discussions about uh, where these objects ought to be. Should they be in Dundee? Should they be in Edinburgh? Should they be somewhere else? So that is, that's my hope for, for that work. Well, that sounds amazing. I think uh, everyone wants to take your class now, Kate. <laughs> um, Manhattan, we've, we've just got a question in, um, which I think kind of builds on, on what Kate was just saying as well. Um, it's a huge question, so don't feel that you have to kind of tackle it all. But I think there is a sense of, of what do you do with the information that you find, right? And, and, and Kate's sense that, that actually the work that students are producing is really important, that it should be kind of kept and, and, and consultable and all the rest. Um, so with this kind of, with this information that you're finding around um, links um, between St Andrews and, and, and slavery, what, what do we do with that information is the question. How should it change our actions or our thinking or our behaviour? Um, <laughs> very difficult question. I think um, right off the bat, I'd say, please uh, 
stay up to date with the Spence project and, and what we're going to be doing in the future. Um, um, on a more serious note, I think we, we've currently been having a lot of discussions of what our role within the project actually is. Um, because there is almost a duopoly of whether we are uh, foremost a group which is historically um, based in isolation in terms of we have this data, we will find it, and then that's our, we're totally hands off on this. Um, I think we've we've temporarily lost Manhattan then, but I'm hoping he's gonna he's gonna come back uh, soon. Um, Aaron, I don't know whether you have. Hello. Oh, you are there. Oh, okay. hello. Sorry, um, I don't know how much of that you got. Um, not very much. Um, I think you, mm -hmm. you you cut out when we got to, you know keep up to date with the Spence projects and and, and the sense mm -hmm. that. Um, anyway, you, you carry on. Um, sorry about that. I um yeah a a. An issue we've we've currently been having is a case of where does this project um, stand in terms of whether it is historical almost entirely, um, which it would be expected to have a historical project, whether we just find this information and then that's almost the end of it. We're totally hands off on that regard. Um, but the issue is with this information that we've we've come across, it's very pertinent to people living within St Andrews um, and also Fife as a whole. We were discussing about um, if someone was to learn something about almost anywhere in the UK um, and they were staying within a building, a hotel, walking along a road that they walk through every day on the way to classes. Does learning about this information change the way in which they interact with their environments around them? Um, and I, I think what we found of that is, is almost finding a, a happy medium of presenting this information in a sense which is um as as open and engaging as possible and as um available to as many people as possible especially over a range of different backgrounds and um and people who wouldn't necessarily interact with the information originally um and then from there then the conversations can occur I think something that we found within St Andrews um, specifically is we didn't have some sort of smoking gun gotcha moment of, of St Andrews or Fife or anything like that. But it's almost that when you look into these conversations that happens, it's that Fife and Scotland as a whole are not unique in terms of being totally isolated from this. It affected uh, pretty much the entirety of the UK and internationally the effects of it were, were huge and massive. Um, and it's very much having these conversations that we've had um, and discussing what to do with this information is which progress is made. Um, relating it slightly to, to Salter in this regard is something that I, I found when looking through them is, is how warm these photographs come across, despite the fact they are, they are uh, monocolour um, and how much personality and happiness and energy, not only in the titles, but just in looking through them, you can see. And it's to have these conversations that when you look into identity and where people are and um, the legacies of this kind of thing, the second it gets into accusatory or uh, one-sided information, in fact, is put out, the conversation shuts down and it's just, well, that wasn't that a terrible kind of thing. But it's very much having these conversations, learning about the individual stories about this um, and, and, and acting upon them in, in that regard where I think real, real progress can be made into um, discussing it and moving forward from something that was was a, a terrible occurrence, but has shaped the way in which we live today in a contemporary society. Absolutely, and I think you know these three critical conversations have have really been an attempt um, to start that conversation as well um, in St Andrews and and gather together all the people that have been working really hard on, on different projects and trying and, and get some momentum around um, around these conversations and think about what they mean for the museums, for the collections um, going forward. Um, I'm going to wrap things up uh, there, but I just wanted to mention there are going to be some future conversations coming up. Um, there'll be one on the 6th of October um, and one on the 3rd of November, uh, and there'll be more information about both of those on the museum's uh, Facebook page and, and social media. 
Um, and just following on from this conversation as well, as with the previous two events, um, there will be three um, prompts, creative prompts coming on the Facebook page. So if you feel that you want to kind of respond to anything that's been discussed um, during this panel or either of the previous two, then please do um, engage with those and, and let us know your, your responses in various creative ways. Um, but for tonight, I just want to thank again very, very much um, my three uh, panellists, my three um, conversation friends, and um, I'm looking forward to hearing more about everything that you've talked about tonight. And thank you so much for joining us, all of you. Bye bye. bye, -bye.